Hey fellow Logo Geeks, I'm your host Ian Padgett and on this week's episode I'm excited to say that we'll be chatting with David Airy about how to get clients. Before we go into that, I want to thank the sponsor of this episode, FreshBooks. Now FreshBooks is an accounting software that I use on a daily basis to send invoices, log expenses and track the time I've used. It looks beautiful and is super easy to use and is a tool I highly recommend. If you'd like to check it out, they kindly offered listeners of this show a free 30 day trial. To get this, just visit freshbooks.com forward slash logo geek and enter logo geek in the how did you hear about us section. I'm really excited about this week's podcast as we'll be chatting with an idol of mine, David Airy, who's a brand identity designer and writer. He's the man behind the popular blog and book of the same name, Logo Design Love. He also wrote a book that had quite a big impact on me when I read it and is probably one of the reasons why I eventually went part-time freelance. Uh, This book is called Work for Money, Design for Love and I highly recommend anyone that's listening to this that are considering going freelance or setting up their own business to read that book. It's fantastic. I've been a fan of David's for many years and have read most of his blogs during that time. I've been really inspired by David and everything that he's done to the point that I don't think Logo Geek would ever have existed if it wasn't for him. Because of that, it's a real honor to have had the opportunity to speak to him and to have him as a guest on this show. So from Northern Ireland, I welcome David Airy to talk about getting logo design clients. Before anything else, you've got to be good at what you do. And you've got to have confidence that you're good because no one wants to buy bad design. So if you think you need to get better before you can lead a client through a project, then you need to train yourself, whether that's in design and then the quality of what you create, or maybe it's in your your sales skills and knowing how to turn a prospect into someone who hires you. Clients, they hire me either through word of mouth, through maybe picking up my book, or through finding my website. Everyone, when they when they start out in design, there's no word of mouth at all because you've got nothing to, you've got nothing behind you to draw upon. So there's, so I'll, I'll not go into that at all, but much more realistic is to have people find you through a, a side project, something that shows your interest in design and that design for you is more than just a way to make ends meet. If you, Think about it this way. If you, if you take two people who do the same job, one of them enjoys it and the other one isn't really that bothered, give me the one with a smile on their face every time. You know, they'll, they'll be more reliable and they'll do their job better. So if you can use side projects to show that that person is you, it gives you an advantage over the thousands of designers who have nothing more than a, a portfolio. It's like the, the podcast that you're doing, Ian. I, I, I bet that it puts you in a 1% bracket of designers who have a portfolio and a podcast. I can, I can, I can agree with that because, um, Logo Geek started as a side project. I mean, I was just working on Legos for fun and you're totally right with that. Like that doing something that you're passionate about and putting your work out there, that does attract other work. I mean, even things that I've done for free for friends, um, you know, things that have really excited me, mm-hmm. putting it, I think that's probably the most important thing is physically putting it out there, you know, showcasing it on all these um, different online portfolios or even on a website. Um, it does attract more business. So that's brilliant advice. Yeah, definitely put the work out there. You know, because you know, if you don't, no one's going to, no one's going to hire you. It, it can take a bit of a, it can be a bit of a struggle overcoming that at the start. You know, you you want something to be perfect, but you've just got to you've got to start somewhere. You know, realize that you're never going to be as good as you want to be because you, you want to continually improve what you're doing. So you might look at your work and think, oh, it's it's not quite right, or I need to change this about it. But you just got to say to yourself, you know, show it to people. There's a book by Austin Kleon, show show your work. It's a good one. I mean, in terms of what you said about putting your work out there, 
where would you start with that? Other than other than your portfolio, you mean? Um, well, I, I guess um, would there be a particular um, showcase website that you would possibly put your work on to put it out there, or would you like literally just start with a website? Well, I, I, I start with a website, but I, I know that people have had success putting their work on Behance, but. I've, I have a port I have a profile there but there's there's nothing I don't I'm pretty sure there's nothing on it uh, it can it, it could be great if you have a lot of you know you can get a lot of views that way but I'm I'm not sure how many clients search through Behance. have you had any success with it um to be honest I haven't used it myself just because I, I mean I'm where are my clients come from personally is through my website yeah yeah it's, it's the same well I mentioned that some clients find me through my book and that's that's the value of side projects like my, a client that I've just finished working with for example uh, a psychiatrist in Brooklyn he, he sent me an email after picking up a copy of my book so even before we spoke the book had done quite a bit of work in establishing trust you know, the, the trust that someone needs to have if they're going to pay me thousands of pounds with it, without ever meeting me in person and it was only a few days after that initial email when his his first payment reached my account, and it's not a it's not a one off. You know, I've had a, I've had a few clients based in Moscow, and I know for sure that before hiring me, one of them had bought the the Russian translation in a bookstore. So the the ability for that to happen at all came through a side project. It was first the Logo Design Love blog, and then that turned into a book. So, you know, a, anyone can do it. It's just it's easy. It's easy to do. It just takes work. It just takes making a start, and it was. It was that start of me. It was when I arrived, launched the Local Design Love blog in 2008. It just, you know, it was, it was a side project. I, I didn't think too much of it. It was just a few hours each week that developed into something a little bit bigger and then got me an approach from a publisher. So it's, it's, it's funny how these things turn out. So for you, has it been the book now and uh, your website that's literally drawing in clients? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I'd say about half of the, the work that I do is probably word of mouth. So, people are going to people are going to see my website before they they learn about my book. But I've also had clients who have told me that they they found my website through a Google search, and then they went on to buy my book, and then after seeing that, then they contacted me. So there's. It's 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 really got a lot to do with trust. If you can, if you can make your client think that you're the least risky person to deal with, then you know side projects that show your passion is they're going to help a great deal. Okay, so for those that already have clients, um, in instances where they want to get bigger clients, I mean like higher paying clients or you know even potentially names, do you have any like different advice? Um, for that group of people, I mean, I'm kind of imagining it's possibly the same answer, like getting books out there and um, blogs and showing your passion. But I'm just curious if there would be a different um, answer for that question. Mm -hmm. Well, bigger clients obviously pay more money, and if they're going to pay you that money, it, again, it's like you you said, it's possibly a similar answer. It, it, again, it comes down to trust. Now. That's, that's not a new thing when clients get to a certain size. Even the smallest clients are right to be cautious before hiring you. It's like any time you, you spend a hefty amount of money on something before you actually get what you're paying for, you do your research on who you're paying and it's exactly the same with design clients. More so when they're spending tens, maybe hundreds of thousands. So always expect your potential clients to see every detail there is about you online. They're, they're highly unlikely to see it all, but you've got to show that you're a professional and be consistent about it for years. It's, it's been a gradual thing, me growing my business. If you happen to land a, a multinational in the first couple of years, well, you're doing better than I did. It was about, it was about three years into, into business when I got a project with Yellow Pages. And that was after they emailed me out of the blue. So there was, there was probably an element of luck in there about how they actually found my portfolio. It was, it was because of my blog. Someone who was working at the company at the time paid an interest in the, the design posts that I, were, that I was writing about and showing my sketches. I think that made a big, made a big deal. Mm. 
if, if Yellow Pages came to me today, I'd be doing things differently. For a start, I'd be, I'd be putting options in my quote. I, that's something I didn't do whenever they contacted me. Oh, what was it? It was back in 2008, 2009, maybe. I, I gave them one figure for the job that they asked for. And that meant that their choice was either a yes or no. But when I send quotes today, I generally put three price options in there. So the client, instead of deciding whether to hire me, they're then left wondering in what way are they going to hire me? So it makes it more likely that they're going to actually say yes. Okay. So, I mean, in, in terms of those, like, three options, how, just so that I can understand, how does that make a difference? Because I guess, I mean, I'm probably not doing it the best way, but I'm I'm offering one price at the moment for everyone. And um, where I'm justifying that is that I'm running my business part-time. So if I can make X amount of money each month, that um, covers everything for me. But I mean, in, in terms of those three options, are you doing like a, a low version? I mean, you don't need to say any prices, but are you doing like a low version, mid price and high price and like slightly differing what those uh, services are? Yes, I'll give you an example of the the last quote that I sent. A company in Dubai approached me. They asked for a redesign of their logo that they'd been using for more than 17 years. It's it's not the best logo and the person, the, the person who contacted me knows that it can be better. So that's, that's their only reason for contacting me was to get this redesigned. And in our discussions, I was asking if they wanted it refined slightly so that they kept the brand equity that was behind it, or if they wanted a complete redesign, something, something completely different. And the logo was going to be placed on a range of packaging because they, they ship stationery all over the world, things like hole punchers and ring binders, that type of thing. So what my quote was broken down into was the first option was simply for the a refinement of the logo. That was the, the cheapest one. The second option was for a refinement as well as a redesign, so they had some, some, some comparison there. And then the third option was for the refinement, the redesign, to give them that comparison, and then to design uh, the packaging as well, so that the, the full range of products looked consistent. The, the packaging wasn't something that they mentioned whenever they wanted to hire me, but as a result of me putting that in my quote, they chose the second option, which was the redesign and the refinement, and then they asked me if they can do the packaging after after we finish this stage. So I could have just, you know, whenever I started out in business, I would have just given them a quote for the refinement. But I've I've I'm able to earn well, about three times as much um, to do to do those additional options. And it's not like I'm stealing money off them, you know, it's it's help that they want. So we we both we both benefit from it. Yeah, it's a really good idea because you're essentially um, providing a quote for what it was they asked for, and then offering something else that they possibly hadn't hadn't thought of that adds more value, mm -hmm. but it's also um, you know more work for you, more money, um, a better client, a uh, longer relationship, and I mean in terms of doing that packaging, the fact that you kind of mentioned that you do that as well. You, you probably um, got a client for life there to some extent. That's really good advice. Now, we know that creating a portfolio is essential for attracting clients um, or a website. I mean, we've spoken about that already. Um, I want to just uh, talk about that with you. I mean, where would you recommend to start with a website? So I'm, I mean, I personally use WordPress. Would you recommend that's the best place? Or, um, I mean, there's, there's things like Squarespace that seem to be pretty easy to get started. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for people? I also use WordPress, and I have been since I started. So I, I definitely recommend it. Whether it's the, the best option, I'm not sure. Squarespace comes very highly recommended as well. With, with Squarespace... Um, it, it might end up being a little more expensive 
it depends on how much traffic you have coming to your website and how much hosting you need. The The cost for me with, with WordPress is minimal. It's, it's uh, what do I spend on hosting? In fact, I get my, my hosting in return for um, a banner ad or a little link in the sidebar. So so I, I, I don't pay for hosting. Well, I, I kind of do through advertising, but the outlay that I have for my websites is, is, is very low. And WordPress has been brilliant. It's helped me to it's helped me to learn a bit about coding as well. Because when I started out, I, I knew nothing. You know, when when I started in business, I had to kind of teach myself how to customize the WordPress theme. You know, without well, just just through online tutorials, of which there are loads for WordPress. So you can't go wrong with that. I mean, I found with um, WordPress, uh, there's quite a lot of free templates. You know, to kind of get you going. Um, but if you did want to like invest, I know you're talking like sixty dollars um, or six, you know, like fifty pounds in the UK. Yeah. I through websites like Theme Forest, you can find really good bog standard templates. And um, like I understand with your one that you've modified the HTML, which I really feel like I need to start doing that now. Um, but you don't have to do that. You can literally take these templates. Um, do like an install, and it's just a case of adding in images. Um, I mean, from that side of it, it's quite manual. Um, but yeah, WordPress makes it very easy for you to, um, you know, build anything you want to some extent. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are so many themes out there that even if you were to choose one off the shelf, yeah, it's 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 kind of likely that you can still differentiate yourself, even though there's going to be other people using the same thing, because. Ultimately, it all comes down to the work that you put on it. My preference for the theme would be just to keep it keep it simple. When you strip it down, all you really need is a home page, a work page with your individual projects, um, a profile page, and then a, a journal or a, or a blog. Um, when you when you've just graduated, I'm thinking about any students that might be listening. When you've just graduated, all you tend to have is a collection of classroom projects without any client involvement, and if that's the stage you're at, the goal is when you have those projects on your website, the goal is to replace each one, starting with the weakest, with work that you've been hired to do. It's 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 obviously tough to get hired whenever all you've got is a student portfolio. And that, that leads on to pro bono design where it can play a big part. That, that doesn't mean pro bono is only good for the early days of building a portfolio. You know, it can be great all through your career. You know, Paula, Paula Scherer often talks it up. You know, it's one where you approach it, you, you, you give your, for the greater good, that's the rough translation of pro bono, you give your work for free for a company, for a charity, a non-profit, for example. And then they, in turn, they use the work and then you can take photos of it or, you know, put it in your portfolio as an example of a client project. I mean, for those people that haven't, really done a lot of work um, other than what they've done in university for example, uh -huh. how would they go about getting pro bono work? They would contact charities directly. So just literally go on their website, go on the contact page and send send an email or pick up the phone? Is that is it just as simple as that? It can be, it can be but I, I, would, I would recommend approaching small charities because large ones they're going to have you know, they're they're going to pay a lot of money for design. They're they run like any other business. Well, a small charity is also run like any other business, except it doesn't have the money to back it up. So, if you go to a small charity, a local one as well, so that you can meet them face to face and build a better relationship that way, then that relationship that you build with the business owner, they they can then give you some word of mouth referrals that that can grow your client base as well. I've done work for a couple of charities. Um, to be honest, not for the reason of doing portfolio work, but I mean, other than putting stuff in your portfolio, to be honest, when you see when you see a charity using your work for the greater good, it feels good as well. Um, so I mean, that there's two sides to it. You're doing something um, good, but then also you're exposing yourself to real world clients, and you've got a physical project that you can do a case study. Now, I mean, in terms of portfolio, um, in terms of the pieces you put in, would you do some kind of 
case study around that as well to show how it works, yes. how, how you've gone about doing that? Yes, definitely. It's the case studies that that tend to get you the, the better clients because they, they can get a real sense of how you work through a project. There are so many portfolios where all you might see is a final logo, but you don't see any of the thinking behind it. You don't see any of the meaning behind an otherwise abstract symbol. You know, if, if you t- a good logo has to be simple, but it also has to be distinctive. So there needs to be some features that help it stand out from other simple marks. And at the same time, it has to be relevant to the business that it's identifying. So with, with such a simple idea, or such a simple mark, should I say, the, um, the meaning can often need a little explanation, which some people think that that might be a bad thing. What, what good is a logo if you need to explain it? But people who run a business, if they're looking at something every day, they want there to be a, a mean, meaning to it. They want, they want to feel some kind of ownership or some kind of involvement where they might have been they might have had, they might have had some say throughout the process. If you can, if you can show that through a portfolio case study, and explain the various steps that were involved, then it's going to make potential clients more interested in following that process with you themselves, rather than then just coming to your portfolio and seeing um, a variety of the, the finished article. I want to take a quick moment to talk about the sponsor of this podcast. Fresh books. When I first started to get paying clients, I would use Excel spreadsheets to log payments and expenses. Then I'd use InDesign to create my invoices. This was great when I first started, but once I started to get more clients, my problem was everything took too long and it started to feel very unorganized and unprofessional. When I found FreshBooks, it made my life so much easier. Invoices were quick and easy to create, and I could easily keep an eye on my profits and expenses too in a beautifully designed dashboard. I not only felt more professional, but everything was also more organized and it freed up time too, so that I could focus on my logo design projects. Now I'd highly recommend you checking out FreshBooks because I think it's fantastic. And to do that, FreshBooks has kindly offered the listeners of this show a free, unrestricted 30-day trial. To claim this, simply visit freshbooks.com forward slash logogeek and enter logogeek in the how did you hear about us section. Now let's get back to the interview. Loads of people make mistakes when they start out, so I think that's probably a good area to talk about now. So what are the typical portfolio mistakes that you see? One is including every piece of work that you do. There might be jobs you take on that pay better than average, but that might not be as exciting as normal, or the result isn't any better than your other portfolio entries. And, and that's fine. Those jobs might make it possible for you to work on the, the brilliant opportunities that don't pay as well. So. Don't worry about doing work and leaving it out of your portfolio. Some of the, the best folios I've seen have maybe 15 or 20 projects. And when you put yourself in your client's shoes, that's plenty to give an idea of how good you are. If you, if you look at largest the largest studios like Pentagram, for example, they might have hundreds of projects on their website. And that's understandable too, because they have a lot of people involved in, in, in the work, so they don't want to be doing the work and then not having it online. In my case though, as a, an independent designer, I think there are maybe about 20 projects in, in my portfolio at the minute, and I'm not massively keen to increase that number, but if it comes to a new project that I finish, I'm much more likely to take out one of the weaker projects and replace it with a new one. So uh, it's a kind of continual progression in quality. Mm, I understand that. I mean, one one thing that I'm thinking of with that, because I, I, I totally agree that it makes sense to only show a handful of pieces. Um, but what I found in my experience is that 
sometimes people cannot see beyond um, a company. So, for example, if you've got loads of fashion brands in, in your portfolio and you get a plumber that might come in and they want a logo, you know, they, they might have the budget to, um, you know, to work with you. But if they don't see examples of that in your portfolio, I found from my experience that they might not necessarily go with you. Mm-hmm. Um, have you faced that problem? And I mean, is there any way to get around that with just a small selection? I have faced that problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. A lot of, not a lot, but every now and again, people will come to me and they'll ask me if I've worked on a project in their specific industry or, or sector. And if I haven't, I'll explain to them that, well, I'll, just, I'll tell them I haven't and, I, and I'll say that it's the, it's the same. I follow the same process no matter what company I'm working on. That's, I, I do design. I don't do their business. They specialize in what they do and I specialize in what I do and I can translate design across, across any market, across any industry. So it's 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 more a matter of trying to ease any fears that they have and sell myself a bit better and uh, as being a good designer. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, are there any more uh, portfolio mistakes that you've seen? Yeah, not enough context. Uh, a single page that shows all your logo work, for example, that that can be good if it's just you know a lot of logos in isolation. As long as you give some of the designs their own page with more project details, you know, if all you're showing is a logo on its own, it gets much harder to differentiate you from websites that sell contest listings, for example. Uh, another mistake, too much jargon. You've got to write like you talk and also write like you're talking to your next client rather than another designer. What's an example of the jargon that's being used? Oh, Oh, this synergize, you know, words like that. A lot right, of branding okay. speak. Is it uh, like generally terms, like typography terms, like kerning and... Yeah, exactly. Editing. Exactly. If you're going to... It's okay to talk like that, but you have to explain things. You, well, unless you know that, you're, that the person you're talking to is familiar with these terms, then I, I either wouldn't use them you know, I'd explain it in a different way rather than saying kerning I'd just talk about oh, this, this, the tightness between the letters the individual spacing so that there's no bigger gaps here that, rather than there that type of thing but yeah pretend that I don't pretend <laughs> say that you, you've got to be talking to a friend in a pub you know think of it that way yeah that makes sense keep it simple be on the client's um, level that's good advice. Yeah, yeah. And another mistake would be tiny text uh, or a lack of contrast between the text and the background. You know, my, my eyesight's already, and it's not perfect. I wear glasses when I'm on my computer or watching TV. But the amount of websites that I go on, I, I really shouldn't have to manually enlarge text to, to be comfortable reading it. So that's, that's, just, that's, that's more the design, the design of a website. But... Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, a lot of uh, people out there are using small text and, you know, in a light gray, which to be fair, it looks nice, but you can't read it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess all of these pieces of advice is basically they all they all link together in some way. You're, you're advising to make it easy for the client, um, allow the client to understand um, what you're doing to speak in the client's language, I guess, rather to create the website and the content from the client's perspective. Do you have any more um, tips that you want to add to that? Another another mistake is one when I fell into in my early days, and that was feeling the need to make yourself look bigger than you are through your website. You know, have, having done this myself, I can understand why people do it. It's something that I still see. Yeah. I was worried that no one would hire me if they knew that I was working alone, but that's that's just irrational. You know, people hire you based on the strength of your work. Well, actually, that reminds me of a speech. Neil Neil Gaiman he he once gave it was a commencement speech. I think I I put it on my blog. I like it that much. He he said that people get hired for three reasons: because their work's good, because they're easy to get along with, and because they get the work done on time. But his point was that. You don't need all three. You know, two out of three is fine. People are going to tolerate how you know, 
know, unpleasant you might be if your work's good and on time, or people will forgive the lateness of your work if it's good and they like you. And you don't have to be as good as everyone else if you're on time and it's always a pleasure to hear from you. That's that's something that stuck with me because I know I'm not as good as everyone else and I'm never going to be as good as everyone else. But if I have if I enjoy my work and I want to do a great job for the people who hire me and I get the, the work done on time to the best of my ability, then if I can make a living doing that, I think it's a, it's a pretty good place to be in. I took that advice from you um, when I read one of your books. I think it was in the Work for Money um, book. Uh, when I first started out, I had a lot of people telling me I should make my business sound bigger. And I did start using we, we, you know, kept it in we, uh-huh. but it was me on my own. And I did find that the moment I did switch it to being honest and open and literally, you know, putting my name, I actually got more business from that. And the the people that was getting in touch with me at that point, they were more on my level as well. Like um, most of the clients that I'm working with, I, I kind of feel like we're at the same stage in our business. And I, I think, you know, being honest, it not only attracts, you know, similar people to you that want to work with you, it, um, you know, when, when the person starts working with you, they, you know, it's, it's more realistic, <laughs> you know, it's exactly what you would expect. So from a branding point of view, it makes sense that if you're a one man band to present yourself as a one man band, but if you're saying we, you know, when you call in, you would expect someone else to answer the phone. You would expect to, you know, potentially be able to come in. Like there's more, there's great expectations if you're pretending to be a branding agency. Yeah. So that, yeah. Advice. That's yeah. That's that's a good point about bigger expectations too. Uh, and on the on the flip side, when you show that it's just you, people like that too because they know that when they hire you, you're going to be doing the work for them. Whereas if they're at a, if they're approaching a, a bigger studio or agency, the person that they speak to first, they might not be the person who's doing the work. In fact, they're 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 more likely not to be the person doing the work. So there's there's more accountability on you and, and the, the person knows that when every time they talk to you, you know, you, you don't have to relay their, their words to somebody else. You can, you can get the job done straight away, you know, hang up the phone. Okay. I'm doing this now. And it's, it's, it's just, there's more, well, I wouldn't say there's more trust because huge agencies or studio design studios can be trustworthy, but when you're dealing one to one, it's more it's more of a, a human relationship, you know, rather than rather than having a middle person involved. Mm, you're right, because um, if someone's looking to work with an agency, they will go to an agency. But there are a lot of people out there. I'm finding they do want to work with a freelancer. They are specifically looking for one person that can do everything for them, and I think. You know, I, I guess it depends who your target audience are. But if if you're planning to, you know, to work as an agency, then you know from the outset you need more than one person. Mm-hmm. Then it makes sense to start presenting yourself in one in one way. Yes, definitely. If you do a Google search, you'll quickly see that prices vary drastically. I mean, there can be anything from someone on Fiverr charging only five dollars for a, um, a logo versus um, agencies out there that are charging, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a logo. Yeah. Um, so this put, when you're a freelancer, it makes it really hard to know how much to charge. And um, I find in a lot of, um, like, groups, communities, generally that's the, the biggest question that comes up, like, how do I know how much to charge? Mm-hmm. Now... I've seen this in your book and on your website, but for the sake of listeners, would you be able to talk through your um, pricing model for how much, say, how people can work out how much they should be charging? Because I think the advice that you give is probably the best. Yeah, at, at the start, when I first started out, the easiest thing for me was really just simple maths. I, I figured out how much I had to earn to cover the outgoings, things like food, your rent or mortgage, you know, bills, clothes, car insurance, dental appointments, that type of thing, software subscriptions. 
I divided what I was spending by the amount of working hours in a week to come up with the hourly rate that just about covered everything, and then I doubled it. Because we need to make a profit or we, we won't be able to carry on through the, the inevitable quiet times. Now, I've, I've been self-employed for about 12 years now, and I still get the odd month or two when inquiries dry up. I wonder where the next project's going to come from, and you know, I start start getting these thoughts, oh, am I going to have to get a real job, <laughs> sort of thing? Not that design isn't a real job, but I sometimes feel like I'm, I'm, I'm blagging it a bit. Uh, but an important point is that despite starting out by basing my quotes on the number of hours I worked, it's, it's much better to show a flat fee on your invoices. I'm, I'm sure you, you know this yourself, Ian. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. When you bring hourly rates into the equation, it, it punishes efficiency. You know, if one person takes 10 hours to do a job, you could do the same job in five hours because you've learned twice as much or because you're twice as skilled. That, that doesn't mean you should charge half what the other person charges. If anything, you should be charging more because you saved your client time. So price, pricing is tough. It gets, it gets easier, especially as you get more confident. Now, I don't, I don't base my pricing on, hourly, on an hourly rate. I'll just base it on what I think that I'm worth. And that's something that's only come over time. I will I'll continually increase my prices because I know that I'm continually learning more as I do more work. And sometimes that will get to the stage where a few a few quotes will be sent out and I won't get any response. I'll be quiet and I'll be wondering you know, if I'm if I am pitching too high, you know, as I can always lower it, you know, for the next for the next quote if because it's it's always a balancing act. You're never quite sure if what you're charging is is the right figure, but you've, you've, you've got to, you know, you have, you have to go with something. And it's purely based on, on experience because people, people can tell you what, what they charge specifically, but their circumstances are going to be different from yours, whether it's the job that they're doing, the specific design that, that they're doing or their experience or you know, the, the clients that they're working with. Oh, that, that leads me on to always always base it according to the client. You can't charge a multinational company the same as what you would charge uh, a local grocery store, for example, because the grocery store won't be able to afford a, a huge amount. But if you were to approach a multinational with the same figure that you quoted to a grocery store, you wouldn't get the job because they wouldn't trust that you had the ability to do the work. So, so you need to pitch yourself differently depending on who you're, who you're, you're um, sending the quote to. Okay. I mean, just um, kind of going on from that, how do you know how much you should be charging those bigger clients because I mean for me that's probably where I struggle like I'm I when I started with that kind of hourly figure in my head I increased it gradually you know today I might charge something like well five or ten thousand pounds for a, a logo or an identity project when I started that might have been three or four hundred pounds I was happy then, I'm happy now, and it's been a gradual increase in between. So you've really just, you've got to start somewhere and then realize that you're getting better doing your job the more you do it. So it, it only makes sense to charge more. What, at what rate do you increase it? I, I, I can't say because I don't know if I'm doing it right, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm doing it right enough to to give me a comfortable life to support my family and and to make my clients happy as well if if you were charging too much you wouldn't get the job and equally if you were charging too little you you wouldn't be able to create a sustainable business mm -hmm. yeah I think that's probably the best way of um, taking it because there's loads of advice on there. I mean, in an earlier episode, I, I spoke to um, 
Chris Doe and uh, he was talking about how he's pitching a project for like $160,000. I mean, it's a, it's an insane amount of money that if I if I got that, I could um, work on that project for an, you know, a couple of years and uh, be happy with it. But yeah. I think as um, freelancers, I mean, uh, Chris is coming from an agency perspective, so it's quite different. I mean, there's um, drastic overheads, but I think it's it's worth charging enough so that you can live the way that you want to live um like for me i'm i'm able to live a reasonably comfortable um life charging around the 500 pound figure mm -hmm. but obviously i need to start taking your advice for the bigger clients because uh obviously that's the way that you get the bigger clients is you you charge more to um you know to show trust yeah, but, and and not only to show trust, but also to to show that your your work is at about a, a level that they're looking for. You know, the big companies they're used to paying fifty thousand, a hundred thousand pounds, you know, half a million pounds for design projects. So if they've come to you in the first place, then you should be expecting to to pay a big amount, or sorry, to 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 charge a considerable fee. But it. The the company that um, I mentioned with the when we were talking about the three the three options in my invoice that that is a is a big company uh, I might have I might have left some money on the table I'm not sure but the situation I was in was that I'd finished a couple of projects and I had one more I have one more lined up for starting later on this month but nothing at at, at this exact time so. I said to myself, well, look, I, w I want to pitch this in a way that shows that I'm that I'm good, but that doesn't have any chance of kind of pricing me out of the water. So I'm, I might have went in a bit lower than I could have with that one, but it's it's hard to say, you know, unless unless you come right out and say, what well, what's your budget? Which, which is something I don't do. You know, there were other ways to figure out how much their budget might be. You know, if you were to ask them, ask the company, you know, what their what their turnover might be, or if you're working on a, a sub brand for a, a multinational, how much, how much, how what was the turnover for that sub brand? You know, there there are ways to figure out the value of a company without actually asking. You know, how much how much money do you have to spend on design? And that's something that Chris. Do can probably explain a lot better than I can. You know, there was a, a video that I put on the Logo Design Love blog that I think I think you might have kindly retweeted or, or linked to. You know, yeah, it's really it's a really good um, video. I mean, I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, but yeah, there, there's loads of good advice out there for pricing. But then at the same time, everything that you've spoken about now. To be honest, it's what the listeners are looking for. You know, it's a, it's a more realistic um, look at, at pricing. Because, yeah, it's very easy to say that you price on value. But what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, <laughs> you can't go in there and, and price for, you know, like the, the value of a logo might be a million pounds, but you can't go in there realistically with that figure. Um, so I think what you've explained now makes sense for everyone at the level that I'm at, um, you know, to kind of understand that, okay, you have to increase your prices to get that business. It's not a case of increasing your prices to get more money. Mm -hmm. It's a case of increasing your prices to be, you know, to show that you are capable of doing that business because those clients are used to um, seeing that figure. So yeah. that's that's for, for me personally. That's really good advice, and I know that anyone listening will also um, take that advice, uh, you know, and and you know, hopefully, action that. Good, good. I'm glad. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. Um, I think we'll um, wrap things up now. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Well, touching on the the quotes on the the options in the quote there that we were, that we were talking about, hi how can I be sure if, if I price the job right? Um, and that, that's a question that I ask myself with, with every quote that I prepare. And it ultimately depends on how quickly your client agrees to your quotes. If they, if they say yes immediately, then you're probably pitching too low for the size of the client. If they try and negotiate you down a bit, then maybe you went in around the right amount and you can then 
you know, choose whether you want to take the job for less than you first quoted, which is always an option. No, don't don't think that if you send a quote and the client says, uh, no, that's that's more than that's more than I can afford. If you if you get the feeling that they can afford a little less, and you want to do the job for a little less, then just let them know. Well, look, maybe we can come to an agreement here, and um, and if you're way over the client's budget, then you're you're probably not the right fit anyway. So determining whether or not you know if, if you've gone in at the right level, it's it's a tough one. It's something that it's something that I'm never quite sure about. So there are there will be there'll be people out there doing it better than I do. But coming back to the point, as as long as you can enjoy your work and support yourself and lead a comfortable life and get better at the same time then then you're 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 on the right track i think that's fantastic uh final words so um david thank you so much for being on the show um it's a real honor for me personally to be able to speak to you um so yeah thanks again really appreciate it you're very welcome Ian. it's been a pleasure Oh, I was so amazing to finally speak with David Airy after reading his books and following his blog for so many years. David, thank you so much for your time and for sharing so many valuable insights in this episode. If you'd like to discuss this episode with me and other designers, make sure to join the Logo Geek community on Facebook. To find out, visit logogeek.uk forward slash community. Show notes for this episode can be found at logogeek.uk forward slash podcast two. If you've enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe. And if you have really loved it and you want to give something back in some way, make sure to write a review on iTunes. That would allow me to get more listeners and continue doing more shows like this one again thank you so much for listening and i'll see you next time